Jude Kelly is founder and director of Women of the World, or WOW, and she was before that the artistic director at the South Bank Centre. She did that from 2006 to 2018. And then before that was the first artistic director of the Battersea Arts Centre, which has just won Experiencing Culture Award in the NLA 2020 Annual Awards. So uh, Jude, perhaps you can tell me a little bit about the, the, the journey of Battersea from a, sort of a threatened council building now to a major and important London cultural hub. Well, my background as a theatre director is somebody who's always been interested in how you tell stories and how you make sure that those stories are not just the stories of the most entitled, the most important, the most known. Um, and so my, my sort of interest has always been how do you really democratise the arts? How do you make the imagination available to everybody? And how do you get everybody to feel as if the resources set up for culture through taxation or whatever uh, belong to everybody? You know, how do you create that, that kind of bridge of confidence since the education system historically has excluded so many people from arts practice and, and art, art, arts valuing? Um, so before I arrived at the Battersea Arts Centre, I had been a, a, I started a theatre company called Southern People's Theatre, which was basically touring community activism and stories and plays around non-theatre, non-art spaces. And then I was asked to apply for this role to take a, what was then a, a completely closed building, the Battersea Town Hall, which was a very important civic building, um, had been turned into a a sort of art centre run by the council for a while. And then the council changed complexion. It went from Labour to Conservative. It was a very conservatively driven moment in British history. And they just closed it completely. And then there was a big um, community campaign to have it reopened. And the council basically said, well, we're not going to run it as a council organisation. If you want to turn it into an independent charity and find the money and get it going, then so be it. Now, I wasn't part of all of that. But I was part of then being asked by a newly formed board, would I create from scratch a centre for the arts that meant something to the people of the community that could be completely independent and kind of, you know, create a policy that, that would have value. So I remember like being taken in through the front door of this very large building for people who don't know it, beautiful building and the dust all for the falling down through the sunlight as I kind of walked through these different rooms um, that had once been used in all different kinds of ways to pay taxes and also to sort of put on shows and thinking, this is exactly what I want to do next because you can take the idea of place and memory and, and think about how, what memories do you want to create with the community? What could this place mean? And, you know, bearing in mind it was so large, and I, I love scale. Um, how can you do the thing that is like a kind of creating a, a, a mosaic tiled floor? Loads and lots and lots of different patterns and different stories and different ideas, but merging to form one sense of value, a, a set of values. Um, including the fact that the place could have a cafe, um, something I really believe in. I really believe in informal cultural spaces. Uh, we could create a bookshop. Uh, again, which you can sort of raise the idea of people being able to browse and find knowledge unexpectedly. You know, I like to create contexts in which people can bump into ideas, not just sort of feel as if they have to go through one channel that you've already predetermined for them. Um, and so I sort of laid out in my head, and obviously in conversation with this newly formed board, how would we acknowledge the fact that Battersea had a very um, old community of white working class families and, and where did they belong in this scenario? How do you take on the fact that actually it was quite a mixed borough in terms of ethnicity, a lot of African Caribbean families, how did they fit into the history of the arts and the history of Battersea? Um, first mayor of Battersea actually was a, a, a black man. Um, how do you accept the fact that the, the, this area, when I took it on in 1980, um, was beginning its gentrification journey? It's a lot more gentrified now. And, and how do you amalgamate those kind of new voices and new ideas with a certain level of entitlement that those people move in with and, and create a kind of mutual respect. Um, and, you know, all the things that 
or important intergenerational work, intersectional work, although that's not a phrase that was particularly used at the time. You know, how do you, how do you kind of get a community to look at itself and go, of course we include disability, of course we include children, of course we include, you know, people whose voices you don't hear very much from, because that's who we are. So I was really trying to say the identity of Battersea, of what it has been, what it could be, what it should be, has to appear as a kind of set of cultural activities inside this centre called Battersea, uh, Battersea Arts Centre. Um, and then to, to do that through this, this vehicle of culture and celebration. Now, you know, if you say the word culture to people, usually it makes people go a little pale. They, you know, they're not clear what you mean by it and they're not cl clear whether they're kind of invited to the party. But, you know, everybody watches films, everybody has, you know, clothes that they choose through kind of a, a fashion ideas, everybody loves music. You know, once you sort of say to people, well, it's, it's all the things that humans use to express themselves, then, you know, I think people get the hang of it quite quickly. Um, but I also wanted to, with Battersea, push the ambition forward, you know, not make scratch theatre or um, experimental visual arts something that couldn't belong within a community context. I really believe in eclecticism. I really believe that the unexpected encounter that people have um, can change their lives and change the lives of the artists who've made work by, by receiving a different kind of relationship to it from people. And that you shouldn't caricature, you know, community art should look like this and, you know, high art should look like this. So, you know, I favor, um, Kind of, we haven't really got the word for smorgasbord. You know, we, we don't really have a word that is as rich and as generous as a kind of smorgasbord platter suggests, i.e. lots and lots of different things um, from things that might be quite hard for your taste and things that are very popular, like, you know, good bread. And But that's what I feel when you're creating a centre for the arts, make it a big, generous place, but you have to know all those ingredients very well. Um, and you, you're obviously deliberately curating different voices and different appetites, but you're also suggesting that, that there's, there's not necessarily a limit to your appetite, or that if you come as one tribe, it doesn't mean you can't merge into another. Um, and I spent five years doing that sort of pattern making and weaving, and at the same time, arguing all the time for the right for a South London space to be as legitimately cultural as a North London space. Now, people who aren't from London or, you know, won't know how significant it, that is, particularly then, you know, at that point in time, I remember getting a bus from the North of London, from uh, Park Lane, uh, where the Arts Council was, Piccadilly, uh, at that point, over to Battersea. And you literally could watch the, the demographic change, you could watch the, um, economic power change, you could watch the educational potential uh, in terms of what was on offer change. And, you know, it's unjust. It, I, I can't bear the, the lack of justice that when you compare one place to another reveals itself. You know, it's everything from can you get a dentist to can you get a good school? And significantly, can you get, rely on first class cultural provision? Of course, the answer is most of the time you can't. So I didn't want Battersea Arts Centre to be good enough for Battersea. I want it to be good enough for anywhere in the world. And then say, and that is how good Battersea can be if you give it the resources and if you give the people the resources. So it's, it wasn't just about um, place making in, in response to a community that already was there. It was about place making in terms of the potential of a community. And I, I do believe this sort of flat landscaping idea of, of cultural rights is very, very critical to democracy. It's very critical to taxation because we all pay the same. You know, it's very critical to the idea of uh, the advancement and progress of, of a nation uh, and a community. And, and it's very critical for artistic practice because artists are as capable as anybody else as being, of being corrupted by the sort of the, the, the certainties that, um, certain kind of financial frameworks give you and the sort of kudos and credit that you get when you go into a certain kind of place and that's a, that's like legitimized tick mark you know you're there 
And it's not right that artists gravitate to those spaces and just stay there. I think it's part of the moral duty of artists is to kind of fling them back, cells back, not into just not just into dangerous thematic areas, but but more difficult um, audience territory, more difficult community contexts, because you know art mustn't divorce itself from social progress. I'm not saying that all artists need to be uh, cultural activists or political, um, particularly politically driven. I'm not saying that, you know. But but I, what I am saying is that we we say about art and culture that it it's there to kind of speak truth to power or you know be a window to the world. And you know, lots of artists and artists practitioners have striven to make that the case over in history, pushing history's boundaries. We've all got to carry on doing that. That's what I think. So. I suppose setting up Battersea Art Centre to what it's carried on doing now, and I can't take credit for where it is now because I haven't been there since 1986, but I think I did set, or we, you know, the people who kind of started it up again as an independent place, I think we set it in train, an idea that it was there to have very, very high ambition, but never to separate itself or segregate itself from the community in which it sat and was given birth. How do you think cultural venues like Battersea and South Bank Centre can get back on their feet after what looks like being probably nearly a year of darkness? Yeah, I mean, COVID's across the world rocked cultural practice, um, been extremely damaging for freelancers, not just economically, but psychologically as well, because it's sort of almost implicitly demonstrated that freelancers are on their own. Um, you know, at the beck and call really of cultural institutions to be picked up or put down uh, when times are hard. And that, that's, that's produced a lot of angst about, you know, should that be right ethically? How can that be? Um, so I think there are two things that are gonna happen post COVID, should we get a post moment. One is that yes, institutions will be needing to recover, but they'll also be needing to change. Things that have been revealed through COVID, which were always there, but it's just, you know, it's the structural inequities around, around poverty, around um, social progress for women, as opposed to men in terms of domestic responsibilities and domestic violence and all the things that have, have been so cruel for women during this period of time. The, the, the racial injustice that Black Lives Matter uh, doubly exposed during the COVID period, because we had the time to watch it and see it and, and kind of have to validate that fact. Um, I think it's made cultural organisations say, well, are they part of change or are they part of the establishment? And where they are recovering, you know, how do they do that in a way that takes those organisations a step further into progress? And I think that's, you know, so there are big questions for them about shared leadership models, about different levels of partnership between small, medium and large within the ecosystems. Um, it's very interesting, you know, there might not be enough money for all the individual organisations to set themselves up as they previously were. So when you're looking for brokering new ideas where you might amalgamate, what kind of leadership does that look like? And who gets to be in charge? There's lots of those conversations going on, kind of under the duvet, as it were. Um, I don't think there's any doubt that the public wants theatre, music, dance, visual arts, museums, architecture, you know, they want all of these things to be things that, that can give them pleasure and, and, and succor. Um, so there is a real need for that vitality to return. And of course, you know, London in particular can't restore itself to, to an economic place that it's, it had previously, unless it has that tourism, much of which is driven through culture. So I think everybody, knows that they need to kind of get it back together as quickly as possible. I think it might take a few years. And in that time, when we get some reflective opportunity, we, we've got to take the next step. All right, if culture and art is for everyone, is that structurally possible at the moment? Or are people still very much excluded? And if so, why? And that's about our education system as well as our sort of ticket and um, programme system. At the South Bank, the, the idea of place uh, was uh, really important to changing what was a, a pretty dull stretch of river and you turned it into uh, a vibrant, popular meeting place. And COVID-19 has sort of accelerated a lot of 
changes taking place in cities and understanding the importance of place and space in the city is 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 one of them. So how do you, how how do you feel when you look at those images of empty city streets and places? Yeah, I think it's um, it makes me think about the war. Not that I was there during the war, but the Festival of Britain, which was the genesis of the South Bank, um, came about as a post-war moment to, to kind of celebrate that humans need each other, that they need to be with each other, that it needs to be a social celebratory space. So, you know, and that came out of a time when obviously through the Blitz and all the things that happened during the war, you know, people were not able to enjoy public space in the same way. So I, I think it's absolutely critical that post COVID Places like the South Bank Centre, you know, the, 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 the big, generous public areas uh, revive very quickly so that people can do what I always watched happening, which was humans falling in love with each other. I don't just mean like personally, romantically, although that's always nice, but actually just, you know, when you see a, a, a throng of humans all doing different things, you know, buying books, their, you know, coffee, um, watching outdoor music, all the things that a, a big cultural landscape affords people. And you, you saw all the variety of people. You thought, gosh, humans are fantastic, aren't they? They're really interesting and wonderful. And I think that's really important that we, you know, we mustn't be drawn into our kind of more hermit-like place. We must enjoy the variety of the human being. And those spaces help you do that. And then, you know, I, I think that the other thing is that even though the South Bank Centre, well, the, the Royal Festival Hall was built to be a concert hall with very particular requirements of uh, acoustic and audience style, if you like. Um, and the Haywood built very particularly to be a gallery in, the, in a kind of modernist but conventional space, i.e. things on walls. Um, one of the things I tried to do at the South Bank Centre was informalise art as well and, and say, you know, that wherever there's a space, you can pop up a musician, you can pop up a, an, a, an intervention of some kind, and that art does not have to be contained to the conditions of convention. Um, and so at the same time as having beautiful conventional spaces, I was also always trying to say the boundaries must be pushed to say that art does not need those things. Art will flourish regardless of those things. And I think this is very critical as well, because just supposing, you know, that COVID keeps returning and returning, um, or the economic situation means that we actually can't afford to keep, you know, the air conditioning going in these places or the heating going in some of these places. You cannot then say, well, we can't make art then, can we? Because of course we can. You know, every African village can make art. Every small Aboriginal space you know, in Northwest Australia can make art. You don't need the conventions of art to make art. And I, I think that those big institutions can, if they're not careful, suggest that there is a hierarchy of art making that requires the most expensive um, means of production. And I wanted always at the South Bank Centre to, to, to you know, argue the case against that through practice. Yes, we have a 90 piece orchestra, doing something extraordinary in the Royal Festival Hall. But here, look, we also have like nine disabled artists outside on, you know, uh, on, on, in, in wheelchairs performing something choreographically that is super amazing. Um, and we need to recover that, you know, let's not start recovery by like a top down approach. That's not going to bring the joy that we need. As a champion of gender equality and, of course, equality in general, is the pandemic also, do you think, accelerating uh, positive change in that area? Will we emerge from the pandemic better and more compassionate, do you think? I think the jury's out, Peter, on, on this issue of compassion and change. The, the impact on women of COVID has been extremely detrimental. Uh, in, in so many areas. And this is a known fact and governments are collecting all these statistics. However, if you look at the news media and what's get, what gets reported about uh, COVID, only 17% of articles are actually about female-led issues and only 10% of the spokespeople ever present discussing COVID are women. So, you know, you've got the evidence on the one hand that COVID 
needs us to become even more committed to women's energy and place in the world. And then you've got the evidence that we know that fact, but we're doing even less about it. And, and I think that the Black Lives Matter movement also has an anxiety that, yes, everybody's saying, OK, we get it, we understand it, we recognise it. But the actual people who, if you like, hold the reins of power and are, are accustomed to being in power are sort of clocking up, yeah, we, we must do something about that, mustn't we? So unless you change leadership and change policy, then I don't feel optimistic about how much change this can produce. You know, obviously we have the evidence that after the First World War, after the Second World War, there's usually a moment in a crisis where women take the hit um, and then they're called upon to help as frontline services, carers, all the rest of it. And then they're kind of pushed back again because the economic problems mean that women go to the back of the queue. And I am concerned, I'm genuinely concerned that that might be one of the impacts of this. And so one of the things I've done is I formed um, a forum for women creatives because you know it's only been in the last sort of 70 years and maybe most uh, 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 like strongly in the last 25 years, that women like me, you know, a theatre director, a producer, a creative artist, kind of had a seat at any table. Never mind running the South Bank Centre, which is like unusual still. And I don't want the economic impact to mean that women then take this lesser place again creatively. I think it would be terrible for women and terrible for creativity. So I formed this forum around women's creative um, opportunities, and I'm trying to make it global now. Because you know we mustn't underestimate how hard it is to get women into this place, and you know we just had the first vice president woman, first woman of color as well. Um, it you know it's it's depressing that it's the first all the time, and these things can roll backwards. So I want men to take this on seriously as well. This isn't like women doing it for women. It's got to be men have got to want a gender equal world for their own sake not just for their wives or their daughters or their partners, but like because they think that's a more exciting and just world. Duke Kelly, thank you very much. Very inspiring thoughts at this very difficult time. So thank you. Lovely to talk to you, Peter, as ever. <laughs>